As Graham and Scott try to locate the missing man, they are suddenly faced with the most horrific scene ever to be witnessed. I realised then it was a, a human pelt. It was the skin minus the head. The full skin just hanging from the, from the top of the door frame. Looked past it and uh, saw a torso on the ground without a head and without any genitals. There was blood everywhere. A line of blood out from the door into the kitchen area. Uh, there's a pot on the stove. I think I might have even said to Scotty, I'll give you one guess where the head is. The scene is beginning to resemble... Welcome back. This is the story of one of Australia's worst female killers who became known as Cannibal Cathy. By all accounts, Catherine Knight was always a disaster waiting to happen, but no one could have foreseen just how far the depths of her depravity would lead. Knight dropped out of school at 16 and landed a job in a slaughterhouse in the small town of Aberdeen just over three hours north of Sydney. The work suited her and she was soon promoted to a boner. One of her proudest moments was when she received her own set of knives, which she proudly displayed above her bed. Knight married a fellow slaughterhouse worker, David Collette, in 1974. On their wedding night, she tried to strangle her new husband. She later explained it was because he fell asleep after only having intercourse three times. Knight fell pregnant with their first child. During that time, Colette returned home late one night after a darts competition. She burned all of his clothing and shoes and then hit him across the back of the head with a frying pan. In fear for his life, Colette fled before collapsing at a neighbour's house. He was later treated for a severe fractured skull. Knight gave birth to a baby girl, but soon after, unable to cope with his wife's rage, Colette ran off with another woman and fled to Queensland. Knight placed their two-month-old baby on a railway line shortly before a train was due, then stole an axe, went into town and threatened to kill several people. A man known in the district as Old Ted found and rescued the baby only minutes before the train passed. Knight was arrested and taken to St Elmo's Hospital. Diagnosed as having postnatal blues, she was given some pills to lighten her mood and sent home. Colette later convinced a neighbour and the neighbour's 16-year-old daughter to give her a ride claiming she needed to take her infant to the hospital for medical treatment. Once inside the vehicle, Knight pulled a knife on the woman and her daughter, demanding they take her to Queensland to find her estranged husband. A struggle ensued and Knight ended up slashing the woman underneath her eye, an incident that resulted in Knight spending time in a psychiatric hospital. David Collette returned and tried to make a go of the marriage for the sake of their daughter. On the 6th of March, 1980, she gave birth to another daughter. But in 1984, she left Colette, taking their daughters with her. In 1986, she met 38-year-old minor David Saunders. A few months later, he moved in with Knight and her daughters, although he kept his old apartment in the nearby town of Scone. Saunders soon discovered Knight's jealousy and rage and would often move back to his own apartment, but she would always follow and beg him to return. In May 1987, Knight slit the throat of Saunders' two-month-old dingo puppy in front of him as an example of what would happen if he ever had an affair. She also knocked him unconscious with a frying pan. 
In June 1988, Knight gave birth to a third daughter. But after an argument where she hit Saunders in the face with an iron before stabbing him in the stomach with a pair of scissors, Saunders took long service leave and went into hiding. Knight tried to find him, but no one admitted to knowing his whereabouts. In 1990, Knight became pregnant by a 43-year-old former abattoir worker, John Chellingworth, and gave birth the following year to a boy. Their relationship lasted three years before she left him for a man she had been having an affair with for some time. The unlucky lover was John Price. Price was the father of three children, reputedly a terrific bloke, liked by everyone who knew him. His own marriage had ended in 1988. His two-year-old daughter remained with his former wife and the two older children lived with him. Price was well aware of Knight's violent reputation when she moved into his house in 1995. His children seemed to like her. He was making a lot of money working in the local mines and apart from violent arguments, at first, life seemed to be going well. But in 1998, Knight and Price fought over his refusal to marry her. In retaliation, she videotaped items that he had allegedly stolen from work and sent the tape to his boss. Although the items were out of date medical kits that Price had scavenged from the company rubbish tip, he was fired from the job he'd held for 17 years. He kicked Knight out and she returned to her own home, while news of what she had done spread throughout the town. Unfortunately, Price restarted the relationship a few months later, although he refused to allow her to move back in with him. The fighting became even more frequent and most of his friends would no longer have anything to do with him while he remained with Knight. In February 2000, a series of assaults on Price culminated with Knight stabbing him in the chest. Finally fed up, he kicked her out of his house. The following day, he stopped at the Scone Magistrates Court on his way to work and took out a restraining order in an attempt to keep her away from both himself and his children. That afternoon, Price told his co-workers that if he did not come to work the next day, it would be because Knight had murdered him. Despite their pleas that he not return home, Price stated that he was afraid Knight would kill his children if he did not. He arrived home to find that Knight, although not there herself, had sent the children away for a sleepover at a friend's house. Price spent the best part of the evening with his neighbour, telling him that if his truck was still in the driveway after he should have left for work, it meant that Knight had killed him. Price returned to an empty house and went to bed at 11pm. Knight arrived at the house later and sat watching television while Price was sleeping. She then took a shower, slipped into new black lingerie she'd purchased that day and woke Price up. The pair had sex, after which Price fell asleep. At 6am the next day, the neighbour became concerned that Price's truck was indeed still in the driveway and when he did not arrive at work, his employer sent a worker to see what was wrong. Both the neighbour and the worker tried knocking on Price's bedroom window to wake him, but alerted police after noticing blood on the front door. Police arrived at 8am and broke down the back door. Upon entry, what they discovered was described as something from a horror movie and would require considerable counselling for some of them to deal with. After finding the remains of John Price, they located Catherine Knight in a comatose condition on a double bed at the end of the house. She was removed from the house immediately and conveyed to hospital by ambulance. The following account 
is just some of the report by crime scene investigator, Detective Senior Constable Peter Musio, who was the first officer into the premises after the initial discovery. These are his words. About 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 1st of March, 2000, in company with Detective Sergeant Neil Raymond, I attended the premises at 84 St Andrew Street, Aberdeen, in relation to an alleged homicide. Entering the premises from the backyard, my attention was drawn to a piece of cooked meat on the rear lawn. I made an examination of this piece of meat and collected it for further testing. I entered the premises rear door and into the kitchen. Once inside, I saw a large section of what appeared to be human skin hanging from the top architrave of a doorway that led into the lounge room. This piece of skin extended from the top of the doorway right to the floor and appeared to be an entire human skin. Looking through this doorway into the lounge room, I could see a headless and skinless human body. I walked east along the hallway and looked into the entry foyer and saw an extreme amount of blood pooled on the floor. There was a large amount of blood smearing over the eastern wall of the entry. I walked further along the hallway and noticed some blood staining leading from the main bedroom. In the bedroom, I noticed more blood staining, however only moderate amounts. I then left the scene and had a discussion with Sergeant Raymond and other investigating police outside the scene. I re-entered the premises and made a more detailed examination. The rear door of the premises opens into the laundry. Off the western side of this is the kitchen dining room. The dining room contained a wood and steel dining table which had three matching seats placed around it. On the dining table was a tool bag, some clothing, a small blue folder and some prescription medicine boxes. The medication on the table consisted of three boxes of Felidor ER 5mg of which two boxes were empty. There was also one empty box of Prinaville tablets. I noticed a blood trail leading from the lounge room into the kitchen towards the kitchen cooktop in the vicinity of an aluminium boiler. The boiler was on the right side rear element, which was at the time turned off. When I lifted the lid to the boiler, I noticed it was warm to the touch. The pot was full of liquid and on the surface I could identify a skinned human head and a number of cooked vegetables. Just to the right of the cooktop, I saw two prepared meals. Each of the meals consisted of two pieces of cooked meat, baked potato, baked pumpkin, zucchini, cabbage, yellow squash and gravy. Underneath each of the meals was a torn section of kitchen paper with a name written on it. One read Becky and the other read Jonathan. The pieces of meat on the plates were similar to the piece I collected from the rear lawn. On the eastern side of the breakfast bar I saw a small black handled knife which was blood stained and four empty medication blister packs. One blister pack was labelled Luvox, which had 15 tablets missing. Two blister packets labelled Arapax, which had 10 tablets missing from each pack. And the blister pack labelled Promethazine had 20 tablets missing. I saw a blood-stained grey coffee cup, which contained a white fatty substance. There was also a black wallet on the bench belonging to the deceased. I noticed blood staining to the fridge and the handle of the door. There were also smears on the face of the fridge. As mentioned earlier, the lounge room was off the southern side of the kitchen dining room, where I saw the skinless and headless body of a person now known to me as John Charles Price. 
there was a substantial amount of blood smeared over the carpet around the body. There was also an extreme amount of blood pooling on the floor of the entry foyer. The pooling showed marks where the body of the deceased had been dragged about one metre from the middle of the foyer onto the carpet in the lounge room. On the floor adjacent to the right arm of the deceased was a blood-stained 31 centimetre yellow plastic handled knife. The body was virtually devoid of skin and flesh exposing the muscles and some organs. There were a number of wounds present on the body, one of the most obvious being a stab wound to the left side of the chest, which extended into the chest cavity. It was evident to Detective Musio that Karen Knight had murdered John Price, skinned and decapitated him. While the head was cooking in a stew-like substance, portions of his buttocks sliced like steaks, had been prepared in the oven and presented on plates for herself and his two children for dinner. The pieces of meat in the yard also proved to be from the victim's buttocks. Knight had stabbed Price with a butcher's knife while he was sleeping. According to the blood evidence, he awoke and tried to switch the light on before attempting to escape. Knight chased him throughout the house and Price managed to open the front door and get outside but either stumbled or was dragged back into the hallway where he finally died. Knight later went into Aberdeen and withdrew $1,000 from Price's account at an ATM. The autopsy revealed that Price had been stabbed 37 times in both the front and back of his body. After making precision cuts, which I will not go into here, the killer peeled the victim's skin off, including his head, hair, face, and all the way down the length of the body to the feet. The entire skin hung from the doorway by a meat hook. The killer then removed the victim's head. According to forensic pathologist Dr Timothy Lyons, the whole procedure would have taken about 40 minutes. Knight had left a note near the victim's body accusing him of raping her daughter, but this was later proved to be untrue. When police found Knight in the house, she was comatose from the missing pill she'd taken and they would have to wait for her recovery before she could be questioned. When well enough, she told police that she had no memory of anything after she and Price had had sex and before regaining consciousness in the hospital a week later. On March 6th, at a special bedside sitting in the Maitland District Hospital psychiatric wing, Knight was charged with the murder of John Francis Price. Knight then told the authorities she was willing to plead guilty to manslaughter, but prosecutors refused to accept the offer. Shortly before her trial was scheduled to begin in October 2001, Knight pled guilty, although she has never explained publicly why she decided to forego a trial. On November 8th, 2001, Justice Barry O'Keefe sentenced Catherine Mary Knight to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The judge said that her papers were to be marked never to be released, making her the first woman in Australian history to receive a true life sentence. Five years later, in 2006, Knight filed to appeal her sentence, claiming it was too severe a punishment but the Supreme Court of New South Wales dismissed her appeal. Knight is incarcerated at the Silverwater Women's Correctional Centre, a maximum security facility in New South Wales that is home to some of Australia's most dangerous female offenders. 18 years later, Knight is the white-haired lady with a benign smile and twinkling eyes that other inmates affectionately call Nana. She has found religion, she paints and knits, and acts as a queen bee, sorting out disputes among other prisoners. 
but she didn't gain her top dog position of authority by way of intimidation and violence, but because her crime was more brutal than any of the other inmates, themselves convicted murderers and drug dealers. Despite her grandmotherly persona, Knight is always flanked by two guards while working in the prison during day hours. She is not permitted to share a cell with anyone and can never have the most coveted prison job working in the kitchen. Knight has never had visitors and will never see the outside world again. Thanks for watching and remember to subscribe for more murder, mystery and mayhem. Until next time.